Our great Heavenly Father, anoint with your spirit the tongue and lips of your preacher in the ears of thy congregation, that your word preached this day would return to thee in confession, in repentance of sin, and in a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would bring glory to your name and blessing to your people. In the name of Christ, amen. So the question before us this morning is, are you living in the flesh or in the spirit? The full context of the passage we just heard read regarding the denial of Christ by Peter begins actually in Mark 14, 1. As we read there, now the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread were only two days away. The chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, for the people may riot. While Jesus was in Bethany, a woman with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, broke the jar and poured it on his head, causing Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, to then go to the chief priests to betray Jesus. And, of course, they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. Then in verse 12, we read that on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And Jesus sent two of his disciples into the city to prepare the Passover. When Jesus arrived with the twelve... They were reclining at the table, and he said, One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they were all saddened, and one by one said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied. Then, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. Then he says something stupendous that should have shocked each of them. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And then we read, when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then verse 27, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And now, of course, we come to our account of Peter. In verse 29, Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. I will tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Now, when they had arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane, across the Kidron Valley from the place of the Last Supper in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus instructed his disciples to pray. And then he went further and prayed to the Father that the cup might be taken from him, concluding with, yet not my will, but thine be done. And then, of course, he was betrayed, arrested, and abandoned, as Dr. Wasserman so effectively preached last Sunday. And he was then brought before the Sanhedrin for a Stalinist show trial that Reverend Budding illuminated to us two Sundays ago, ending with the high priest asking, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? To which he answered, I am. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So during this Stalinist show trial, while all this was taking place, Peter was down in the courtyard. And as we just heard, one of the servants' girls of the high priest came by. She saw him. She said, you were with that Nazarene, but he denied it. And of course... She came again, he denied it again, and then a third time he began to call curses down on himself and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And of course then in verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed the second time. 
And Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. So within this context, I want to look at four points from our text in Mark 14 this morning. First, the gravity of his and of our denial of Christ. Second, the cause of his and our denial. Third, the purpose of Peter's denial. And fourth, the cure for his and our denial. And then an application of this to us. So first, the gravity of Peter's denial and of our denial. Peter's denial and our denial is very grievous for the four following reasons. First of all is his position in relation to Christ. You see, this was the fall of one of the most favored of Christ's disciples. We understand the principle of election, but Spurgeon notes there is such a thing as election out of election, in that Christ had many disciples, and yet he chose the twelve. But then even out of those twelve, he had especially chosen three, Peter, James, and John, who were privileged to be with him. Just the three of them on various occasions when others were shut out, such as that momentous moment on the Mount of Transfiguration as recorded in Matthew 17, 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So we see how favored the three were. But in addition to that, Peter seems to be especially favored even beyond them. In that, we see in God's revelation to him alone the answer to the question, Who do you say that I am? To which Peter responded, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied to his response in Matthew 16, 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so you see, people, the higher our privilege, the greater our knowledge, and the nobler our vocation is, the more horrible is our sin when we fall into it. Secondly, Peter's fall was especially sad because he had been carefully forewarned concerning it. First, he was generally warned with all the disciples, as we read in Matthew 10, 32, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Now, there's some words that should be ringing in your ears, shouldn't they? And then Peter was warned specifically and personally in Mark 14, 26. We just read, when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, you will all fall away, for it is written, Peter said, even if all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And then, as if that was not enough, once again, in Mark 14, 37, when Jesus, after his agonizing prayer in the garden, came back to the three favored disciples and found them all asleep, he said to Peter, again, Peter specifically, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So you see, Peter knew the danger to which he was exposed. He was not, as Spurgeon put it, as some inexperienced persons are surprised suddenly 
carried off their feet by a fierce, unexpected tornado of temptation. Spurgeon goes on to say, after that warning, he was not like a bird caught in a trap, which it has not seen, but he is like one that flies boldly into the snare. Peter ran into it in spite of all the warning he had received. And you see, that makes his sin and our sin, because certainly no one that has been to this church for more than a couple weeks is unaware of what the world, the flesh, and the devil has for us. This made his sin all the greater, because if we sin against the light, our sin is always so much more aggravated. Further, the guilt of Peter's sin is enhanced by the fact it came immediately after his hasty and fleshly protestation of perfect fidelity to his master. Spurgeon goes on to say, and we should listen carefully to this, Oh, dear brothers and sisters, if we go home while yet the sacred bread of the communion table is scarcely digested, and then so sin and deny Christ, it is a horrible, horrible thing. It would have been so bad enough if Peter had sinned 20 years after making his profession and declaration of fidelity to Christ. But to deny his Lord an hour or two after such a declaration, this was wicked indeed. And yet, how many times have we gone home after taking communion, and very soon thereafter fallen into sin and denial of Christ. Also, observe here in this account of Peter's denial the anatomy of our own sin in the fact that there were degrees of Peter's sin here, and it makes it all the more applicable to us. You see, the first time he denied his master in Mark 14, 67, The servant girl saw Peter worming himself. She looked closely at him. You were with that Nazarene Jesus, but he denied it. Here's what he said. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. See, often when we deny Christ, we try to leave ourselves some wiggle room. Say, well, I just don't understand what you're talking about. Playing dumb. Then... He went out to the gateway. Another girl saw him. This fellow was with Jesus, and he denied it again with an oath, I don't know the man. You see, soon we become more and more obvious in our denial of Christ. So we have to be very careful, don't we, that we don't start giving ourselves wiggle room to leave. And finally, after a little while, those standing near to Peter said, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself and swore to them, I don't know this man. So here, not only did he deny his master, but certainly not in the vocabulary of a true Christian to be swearing to people like this, he compounded his sin, cursing to convince them that he was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a dreadful example for all to see. And certainly this may well be us when we deny Christ and are even witnessed by those around us. That's the gravity of the denial. Point number two, the cause of the denial. In point one, we noted the special status of Peter in being among the 12, among the three, and likely the most favored of God even among the three. So certainly, and this and other scriptures show that he was, be very difficult to argue, he was not born again at this point. But you see, when one is born again, he or she is not delivered from the sin nature of our flesh. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if we were? No, in fact, the opposite is true. The moment we are born again is the battle 
against the very powerful enemy of our flesh. See, before there wasn't any fight, was there? We just did whatever the flesh told us to do. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2.1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All of us lived among them at one time gratifying the crazings of the flesh. And listen to this, obeying its desires and thoughts. See, there was no battle whatsoever. But when you are born again, then the battle starts. So don't ever think you're not in a battle. You are in a battle. The Apostle Peter later in life, likely thinking of his denial warns us of our fleshly enemy in 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires of the flesh which wage war against your soul. See, there, there, there it is from Peter himself. Paul speaks of this in Romans 8.13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body. See, putting to death means war, doesn't it? All out war. And then Paul goes on in Galatians 5.17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are at war with each other. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, on and on and on. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its emotions and lusts. So we as Christians must first engage in war against our old nature, the flesh. We must kill it. We must crucify it before we can even engage in fighting the world and the devil. If we don't, we're helpless against those other enemies that we face. Failure to mortify the flesh was the cause of Peter's denial. Paul speaks of this in Romans 8, 6, the mind of the fleshly man is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. Those controlled by the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the flesh but by the spirit if the spirit of God lives in you. And so it's instructive to us as Christians to understand how Peter failed to mortify the flesh. Because any one of us may be in this exact same condition right now as we are in church this morning. So how did he fail to mortify? Well, first of all, he insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. But what had happened? Jesus said to the disciples, stay here and keep watch when they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then verse 35, going a little further, Jesus fell to the ground and prayed, if possible, the hour might pass from him and the cup pass from him. But then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Then verse 39, once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping. See, this is the degrees of sin. It doesn't mean that you instantly go out and plunge into sin. What happens? I'm too tired to do devotions this morning. Too tired to do evening devotions. Too tired to pray. Ah, oh, it's been a rough day. Yeah, it's been a rough day. Maybe I'll just watch some TV or some YouTube video or see the degrees here. And we just heard, didn't we, our brother Josh Warren talk about Samson asleep in the lap of the world, didn't we? Asleep, asleep. See, you think sleeping and not doing devotions is not a sin. No, that's how the flesh lures you into it. That's why Jesus said what? Keep watch and pray. Keep watch. Peter's failure here is twofold and very instructive to us. He did not immediately, joyfully, and exactly follow his Lord's command. In 1432, sit here while I pray, keep watch. 
and pray. And then in verse 38, watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. Notice Jesus repeated it three times. How many times have we in this church had that repeated to us? We're way more guilty than Peter, aren't we, if we fail to do it? Because we've had it repeated to us every Sunday, every Wednesday night, on and on. Second, Peter had been personally instructed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the importance of prayer and how to pray. See, we share that same guilt, don't we? We can say, well, you know, Lord, I would pray. I have no idea how to do it. I have no idea how to. Could Peter say that? No. We read in Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father. Do not babble like the pagans, for your father knows what you need. But here's how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is. So Jesus Christ personally instructed Peter on how he should pray. And each of us that are here, that have been here over one or two times, also know how we should pray, don't we? In fact, there have been multiple, multiple sermons preached on, on how to pray. And let's see, let's think of Peter's position right now. Was this a time that it might be appropriate to pray? Let's see. Christ had just informed him, well, earlier in the evening, one of you will betray me, one is eating to me. That should be shocking. But if that's not shocking enough, Jesus took the bread, broke it, said, this is my body. Okay, that, that shocked people all the way up through the Reformation, didn't it? The great Reformation argument of consubstantiation and transubstantiation. This is my body. What does that mean? It's a shocking statement. You should think about that. Then he took the cup and said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Boy, seems to me this would be a good time to pray and say, oh God, what is going on here? Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. There's a few things to pray about and all of that, and yet how often do we have all of the issues of life which should spur us to great prayer. And what do we do? Oh no, I'm too busy to pray. See, Martin Luther once said, the many more things I must do this day means I must take much more time to pray. The busier you are, the more you should pray. The stress, more stressed out you are, the more you should pray. So I asked, do you like Peter make provision for the flesh? The Apostle Paul warns us in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, nor to fulfill the lust thereof. And certainly sleeping is one of the lusts, isn't it? Let's just sleep. I'm tired, let's, let's just sleep. Yeah, it was interesting, I walked up here sat down in the chair, and Satan brought the thought, I'm so tired I could just take a nap right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, this is what happens. I'm so tired I could just sit here and take a nice big long, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Dan Benetti could get up and preach my sermon for me. <laughs> and I, I, could just, I could just sleep here. See how Satan works? So Peter failed to mortify and made provision for the flesh by ignoring the command of God's delegated authority. It's not complicated, people. Number one, ignored the command of God's authority. Number two, failed to pray. And then a third way here, consorting with evil company. Okay, so when Peter's standing outside and Jesus is undergoing his show, is Peter gathering up the brothers and praying or even going off on his own praying. No, what is he doing? He is hanging around the pagans and skeptics and rabble of the crowd that had just cried, crucify him, and would further cry, crucify him, standing and sitting around the fire. You see, on a cold night, everyone likes a nice, comfortable fire. 
as Spurgeon notes, Peter was sitting in the seat of the scorner, so we do not wonder that in the end he used the scorner's language. See, keep away from evil company to the degrees you can. So if in your daily calling you have to associate with them, you must have the spirit of watchfulness and prayer, don't you? You must have that. And finally, instead of waiting to be accused of following Christ, so Peter's standing around with the scorners, adopting the scorners' language, and is he reacting to it at all? No, he's dead passive. Instead of waiting to be accused of following Christ, openly and proactively declare yourself to be in him. In obedience to our Lord in Matthew 10, 32, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. And I had a pastor in Susanville that taught me a good technique because, you know, Susanville, it's not highly civilized like Davis. You go into a restaurant and, you know, the guy, na- the booth next to you, they're swearing and, and doing those things. And he said, every time if you're sitting in a restaurant or somewhere and you have someone swearing near you, every time they swear, say, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. <laughs> yeah, every time. You'll find out pretty quick that And pretty quick they stop. Every time they say it, you just say it just loud enough like you're talking in your booth by yourself. See, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See, proactively declare yourself a follower of Christ. Don't wait. Don't hide under the bush. Don't hide by the fire. Now that we have discovered the causes of Peter's denial, let's move on to point three, the purpose of the denial. So Peter's fall, as we noticed in our reading, if we read the scriptures, is recorded in all four Gospels. And at considerable length in all four Gospels. So the first question that may come to our mind is, why did God let this happen? Why not have Peter, after declaring Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Just live an exemplary, obedient, Holy Spirit-filled life. Here's what's interesting is that's in the three synoptic Gospels. Okay, that's not in all four Gospels. Jesus' confession of Christ. Why not leave that until his glorious death as a martyr being crucified upside down? God certainly could have accomplished that. Why instead have in all four Gospels at considerable length Peter deny Christ and have this sad record repeated for the whole world to see? Well, first, to remind us, as Spurgeon notes, that great instructive truth found in Isaiah 7, 9, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. When you, like Peter, say, oh no, I'd never succumb to sin. No, no, I would never deny Christ. No, no, I would never, no. Right at that moment, Satan has you exactly where he wants you. You're toast. If your prayer is, oh God, I will deny you at every moment if I give any provision to the flesh, oh help me Jesus, that might be a good prayer to have. Now, while there's many Christians who might dare to compare themselves to the Apostle Paul, not a good idea, with his unblemished record of serving Christ throughout the scriptures, The best most all of us could possibly aspire to is a Peter-type record of victories with a number of bumps and stumbles in between, but finishing well in the end. That should be what we might aspire to. And while our denials of Christ might not have been as dramatic or well-recorded as Peter's, most of us here have had some just as serious or maybe even more serious and grievous Spurgeon notes that Peter's denial is instructive to us that we should give it fourfold attention. See, it's in the four Gospels. Fourfold attention. 
lest we stumble and fall as Peter did. So the first purpose of Peter's denial is to shockingly warn us, this is us. This is us. If we let our guard down for a moment, if we fail to obey, if we fail to pray, if we give any provision to the flesh, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. Spurgeon notes, Peter's fall says to each one of us, you too are weak, you too will fall if you are left to yourself in any way, if you do not trust wholly on your master, if you do not look to him, but rely on your own experience, your own record in Christ, your own years on your membership certificate. If we rely on any of that, we are done. Next, Peter's fall and restoration are fully recorded to set forth the greatness of our, redeem, our Redeemer's saving power to we who have stumbled and denied him in ways like or worse than Peter. As our, the Apostle Paul notes in Ephesians 2.1, we just read it, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, gratifying the craving of the sinful nature but then verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What mercy there is to be found in this account of Peter because it, it is exactly what we need. The redemption of Christ. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians first one, chapter 1, verse 9. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. See, we're dead. We need to be raised. He has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope because he will continue to deliver us. Is it not wonderful to think, people, that God restores the great backslider, Peter, and you and me. And may we, like Peter, bend before the cross of Calvary, exclaiming what a mercy it is that Christ did not treat Peter as Peter and each of us have treated him. And then looking up through tears of grief and joy as we mourn our great guilt to see it all forgiven in the death and resurrection of our Lord. Oh, praise his holy name. Point four, the cure for the denial. First conviction of our sin in Mark 14, 70, we read, Immediately the rooster crowed the second time and Peter remembered the word Jesus spoke to him. Before the rooster crows thrice, you will disown me three times. Now, it's interesting. This is the only gospel that talks about it crowing twice. It doesn't say it only crowed once and the others, it just said it crowed. But Spurgeon notes that this was to show it's not just the random crowing of a rooster somewhere in Jerusalem, but indeed it was instantly after Peter denied Christ. For just as he was speaking the third time while the words were in his mouth, as Spurgeon notes, shrill and clear over that palace wall came the crowing of the rooster. The word of God. Oh, how that crowing straight from God cut Peter's heart. As we read in Matthew 26, 75, and he went outside and wept bitterly. You see, God has many ways of reaching our conscience. By the words of a little child, by the sudden death of a neighbor or friend, by reading the scriptures, there are many roosters 
that God can cause to crow when he bids them. And may they startle we the sinner as much as that one in Jerusalem startled Peter. And at this Peter went out and wept bitterly. It's always a sign of repentance in Christians who have fallen when they leave the company. Notice he left. He got away from those people and wept bitterly. As Paul notes in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. Saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. The second cure, Peter repented and left the unholy company. Second is our Lord is praying for us. In Luke 22, 31, we read, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. You realize that? The Lord Jesus is praying for you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And mercifully, it's not just Peter that Jesus prays for. We read in John 17, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so your Son may glorify you. You granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you do this morning, he is praying for you. If you don't, you can believe right now. God is calling you. Third, we know from our Lord Christ's answer to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Cry out, oh God, save me this morning if you're not saved. And the apostle Peter speaks of this, tells us to examine our salvation. In 2 Peter 1, 10, therefore, my brother, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. So if you're here this morning and still trapped in your sin, still denying Christ, Paul explains the way out in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you would like to pray this this morning... Speak to any one of the leaders here or even those sitting in the pew next to you. We will pray with you. And finally, most importantly for those of us who are believers, the antidote and immunization against sinning and denying the Lord was proclaimed by Christ after his resurrection to Peter and the disciples as recorded in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. So the cure for denial is repentance of your sin, examining your salvation with fear and trembling and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Christ's restoration of Peter is recorded for us in John 20. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then in John 22, 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus was asking him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see, we may be satisfied with partial restoration, but Jesus Christ is not. We may be satisfied with three denials and one restoration, but Jesus Christ said it three times, didn't he? He took care of all three denials. He takes care of all of our sin, not some of our sin. And then we see this carried out in that 
Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you to sift you as wheat. When you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. And in Acts 4, 5, we read the next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. This was in response to the day of Pentecost, the anointing and baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had Peter and John bought before them. They began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? And listen to this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he's not standing around the fire with the rabble, is he? He's not sleeping. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Said to them, rulers and elders of the people, know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. Now that's being proactive. That's declaring yourself a follower of Christ, but it's only going to happen if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 13, look at the response of these men. They saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Do people around you say, wow, that person must have been with Jesus? Or are you standing around the fire denying him? And this then continued to Peter's death by being crucified upside down as prophesied by Christ in John 21, 18. I tell you the truth, when you're younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you did not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God, and we should all pray, Oh God, help us. We've stumbled. We've denied Christ like Peter, but oh God, fill us with the Holy Spirit. So in closing, my question to you is, will you deny Christ? We have certainly seen people here in this church that like Peter, walked with the Lord, walked with us, seemed to be on a steady path on the highway of holiness, only to see them give way to the flesh to false brothers and sisters, even their own children or relatives, and deny Christ in his church. And then, unlike Peter, never repent and return to Christ or return to us. And don't think that we are immune from that. We should tremble and say, oh, God, help us. Certainly, the cause of their denial of Christ in his church was the same as Peter, not hearing and doing God, the instruction of, the, of God through his delegated authorities, sit here while I pray. Stay here and keep watch and pray. Leading a prayerless, Christless, spiritless life ruled by flesh and self-absorption and relaxation. And as we have just noted, the cure for this is our daily devotions, our watching, our praying, our obedience to the word of God. The apostle Paul speaks of this in Romans 8, 2, through Christ, the law, the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. Amen. So will you live in the flesh and in great mortal danger at each and every moment? of denying Christ, or will you live in the spirit as evidenced by the immediate, exact, joyful obedience to God's word, praying in the spirit throughout each day? If indeed it is the latter, then you will be among those who Paul speaks of in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not just with words, but with power and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we confess we have 
nothing better than Peter to offer. We have denied you. We have sinned. Oh, God, we know you through your word. Peter did not have all the Gospels. Peter did not have the Pauline epistles. Peter did not have daily sermons in this church year after year after year. So we cannot say we are any better off than Peter. Oh, God, when we deny you, when we sin. But, oh, God, help us each today that indeed we would not live by the flesh, but we would live by the Spirit. First in hearing and doing exactly, immediately and joyfully your word to us through your delegated authorities and that God we would live a prayerful and watchful life praying in the spirit at all moments that indeed we would be delivered as Peter was delivered, O oh God. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen.